Good morning, church. So glad you're here this morning. It's wonderful to see you. I'm, I'm excited to be at the end of this chapter. I have, I have not enjoyed this chapter really at all. Uh, but go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 19 this morning. We're, we're going to close this out. And while you're turning there this morning, I'll say a prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be together this morning and worship. I thank you for the, uh, the testimony that was just shared by uh, this group of people that's come together um, really to lay a foundation of something here in this church. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for each person in here today and whatever it is, Lord, whatever it is that's going on in their life in the past that's brought them to this moment, Lord, I, I just pray that you would... Uh, speak to each one of us today through your word, and, and, and I pray that we would each be that living sacrifice that we sang about today, that we would be a living sacrifice for you, Lord. I pray now, Lord, that you would open our hearts, open our minds to, to see and to hear the, and, and to know the truth of who you are. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Genesis chapter 19, we're going to read uh, verse 27 through the end of the chapter, verse 38. I'll read and you can follow along on the screen this morning. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And he saw and he behold the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot, in, in which Lot had dwelt. Let's stop there for just a moment. I, I love this picture really of Abraham. If you remember in chapter 18, Abraham had, had uh, been visited by three visitors. One of those was identified as the Lord. And the other two were these angels that went, went on to Sodom and Gomorrah. And when the, when the angels went on to Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, Abraham was there with, with the Lord, he, it says he stood before the Lord. And while he stood before the Lord, he interceded for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Lord had told him, here, my judgment's coming. I'm going to destroy these cities. And Abraham put himself right before the Lord and he interceded and he said, would you destroy it if there were 50 righteous? If there were 40 righteous? And he worked his way down. And at that moment, he knew the Lord had made a, the Lord had made a promise that, you know what, I'm going to spare the righteous. And, and so Abraham knew that Lot was going to be spared. But what he knew then, this, this is just a couple days later, it, goes, it says he goes back out and he stands in the place that he stood before the Lord. And he sees the smoke going up. What does he know? Okay, that judgment came. But what does he also know? Lot was saved. Because the Lord promised that. The Lord said, I'm going to spare Lot. So he stood in that place, and, 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 and as the smoke's going up, he can see, okay, that judgment has come, but I can also take, I, I can take peace in knowing that Lot has been spared. I love the idea of, of returning to the Lord in prayer. Maybe we've been praying for something. Maybe we've been contending for something. And maybe we didn't get the exact answer that we wanted to. But we, we go back to that same place and we stand before the Lord again. And, and it just kind of reminds me of that hymn, It Is Well. Lord, it is well. When, when I see that smoke going up, I know that your judgment has come, but it is well, Lord. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to forsake that opportunity to come back and stand before you again. And, and, and so Abraham goes to that same place. I think the other thing that I would point out here is this, and, and this is like the ark. If you remember the ark, it says very specifically, then the Lord shut the ark. The shutting of that door on the ark was a sign of God's judgment, but it was also a sign of God's grace. Because, yes, everyone outside the ark experienced that judgment, but those inside experienced his grace. It's the same thing with the smoke going up right here. Yes, it was a sign of God's judgment, but it was also a sign of God's grace because Abraham knew that Lot had been spared. 
that judgment. I, just, I love this picture here. Abraham returning to that place that he stood before the Lord and interceded on behalf of Sodom and Gomorrah and just saying, Lord, it is well. Let's move on to verse 30. Then Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountains. And his two daughters were with him, for he was afraid to dwell in Zoar. And he and his two daughters dwelt in a cave. Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on the earth to come into us, as is the custom of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve the lineage of our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. It happened on the next day that the firstborn said to the younger, Indeed, I lay with my father last night. Let us make him drink wine tonight also, and you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve the lineage of our father. Then they made their father drink wine that night also, and the younger arose and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot were with child by their father. The firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. And the younger she also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the people of Ammon to this day. So, again... I'm glad this chapter's over. I, I, I said to you earlier in the chapter that I felt like the issue in Sodom and Gomorrah was idolatry and pride. Pride, idolatry, I think that those two go hand in hand. And I, and I think there's a fitting end to the chapter here. If we look at Lot's daughters, they had lived their life in these cities where they had seen so much of a broken relationship with our God. And they come to this point, and it doesn't surprise me that, that this is how they react to everything that's going on. I, I think if we look at this, they, uh, his two daughters each had a son, one named Moab and one named Ben-Ami. Both, uh, both of these sons fathered nations. Both of these nations went on to cause great conflict and suffering with the nation of Israel for, for generations and generations. If we look in Judges chapter 10, verses 6 and 7, this is, just, this is just one example. Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and they, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the people of Ammon. God had, had warned the people of Israel, he had warned his children to stay away from these nations. And time and time again, they got themselves tied up with these nations and tied up with the false worship and the, and the false gods of these pagan nations. And, and oftentimes, right there at the middle of it was Moab and Ammon, the two nations that were born from Lot's daughters. And it should not surprise us, knowing what we know about Sodom and Gomorrah, it should not surprise us that these nations were, were known for their pagan worship and their idolatry. Uh, if you look, and I, and I made this point again earlier in the chapter, almost everywhere we see idolatry, we see sexual immorality. In Moab, they were, one of the, one of the uh, gods that they worshipped was a fertility goddess. And the, uh, the, the worship of this goddess was often, uh, was often celebrated in the form of gratification with different priestesses in the temple. And this is how they worshipped. There was a god, one of the most feared gods in Moab was the god uh, Molech or Kamosh. And Kamosh was this, um, was this god that, that was built an altar and, and a, a statue to this god. And it was the depiction of this man and they would place children, babies, on the red hot surface of this altar. And it was designed that the babies would roll down and incline, and incline into the, what looked like the belly of this God. And that's how they would sacrifice these babies. 
And that was the people of Moab. So that's what we're talking about here. That's, that's the type of, again, pagan worship, idolatry that we're talking about that came out of the union between Lot and his daughters. I want to take a moment here, and I, I think this is going to feel a little bit scattered this morning. I hope you'll bear with me. Does anyone remember what book of the Bible we, we read at the end of last year? Don't, don't shout it out. We're in 2021, in case you're having time, time issues. We're in 2021. At the end of 2020, we took a break from Genesis, about a month and a half, right around Christmas, and we read a book, short book. Does anyone remember what that was? We read the book of Ruth. That's right. Okay, we, we took a break. We took a break from Genesis. We had just gotten through the 11th chapter of Genesis, and we took a book. Now, at this point, if, as we say that, you might be recalling that there's a connection between Ruth and uh, this story here in Genesis. It, it says in Ruth chapter 1, verse 4, it says, now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. So when Naomi and her husband had left Bethlehem, there was a famine and they left Bethlehem. They went to Moab and their two sons married two Moabite women. One was named Orpah and one was named Ruth. Now, I mention this just because... I thank God that I'm not smart because I never would have put all this together. And before we studied Ruth, if you would have asked me Bible trivia, the connection between Ruth and Moab and Lot's daughters and the connection to Genesis chapter 19, I wouldn't have gotten any of this. But I thank God that we took that break that we did, that we read through the book of Ruth, so that now we have a little bit of context here and we can tie some things together today that I hope we'll, we'll be able to do here at the end of this service. So keep that in mind. So Ruth was a Moabite woman. She came out of the culture that we just talked about. The, the culture that worshipped the god Melech, that, that they would sacrifice babies and, 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 and roll babies down an altar and, and, and to be consumed by fire into, the, into this god they worshipped. That's, that's, where, that's where Ruth came from. Today in our message, I have three questions for you. and, I, and these are, Sometimes I share with you the questions that I ask myself in, in, uh, in preparation for the service. This morning, these are questions for you, questions that I have been asking myself, but questions I want you to consider as well this morning. And like I said, it might feel like we're a little bit all over the map today, but, but bear with me. The first question is this, why don't we send our kids to youth? And that one, I, I, that you're like, okay, where are we going? We're way off the map here. Bear with me. Why, why don't we send our kids to youth group? And, and I'm asking that question, I'm, I'm honestly asking that question. And, and even today as I thought about it, like there's, there might be a better way. Maybe I should send out a survey. But to be honest with you, you guys don't read the emails that we send out. So, and I know you don't because I get a report literally when I send them out that tells me how many people even bothered opening the email. The last one I sent out was 27%. I don't care. You're not offending me. I mean, it's like, it's fine, but there's really not a good way to communicate. This is the time that I have with you. This is the time where, for the most part, you're listening or you're sleeping, whatever, but you're here and you're listening. And so I want to know why we don't send our kids to youth. And I'm asking you, and I, I would appreciate feedback. I, you have my number, and if you send me an email, I'll read it. You don't have to read the emails I send to you, but I'll read your email. If you want to send me an email, text, call, if you want to get together, I would be happy to sit down and talk with you. But this is something that's been on my heart for a while, and I, and I just wanted to throw a few things by you. It's, it's been summer, 
I figure, you know what, it's not, it's not a whole lot uh, of good to address this in the middle of summer. I know summer's crazy. We're all going to and from, and we've got a million things going on. So we're, when summer's over, school's back in session, why don't we send our kids to youth? And, and part of this hit me when we had a, a small number of kids that came back from a mission trip in Kentucky a few weeks ago. And, and, and we haven't had a chance to hear from some of those people yet, but we will. I'm not going to forget that. We'll, we'll get a chance to hear from some of them. This type of, this type of trip can be such a life-changing event for not just kids, but anyone, adults, kids, whoever goes on a trip like this. These, these events, these times in life, and even, even if we go, and if you'll listen to what they're saying, they, they went to a place that just really has poverty at a level that I'm not sure we can really understand. And so you go there with the purpose of let's help them, let's serve them. It's not about us or what we're going to get out of it, but let's go and help them. But, but if you do go with that attitude, which is the right attitude, I promise you, you're going to get a lot out of it. And so when you talk to the, the people that went, that's exactly what happened. And when they returned from that trip, one of our youth leaders was at prayer on Wednesday night, and she was praying for the youth. And she was praying not just for the kids who come to youth, but she was praying for all the youth of this church. And she was praying for the youth of this community. And she was pouring her heart out in prayer for these kids. And I'm thinking, why wouldn't you want someone like that in your kid's life? Who's just absolutely pouring her heart out in prayer on a Wednesday night for kids that she doesn't even know, a lot of them. Why wouldn't you want someone like that in your child's life? I was thinking about the history of this church. Of course, I have a long history with this church and, and so many wonderful memories and, 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 and the, the, the role that the youth group played in my life growing up. I was thinking about this yesterday. We were working at the church and there's Chad and there's Seth and Andrew was there. And, 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 and of course, I could go through this church and I could name a lot of people that were in this church right around the time frame that I was growing up when I was youth aged. And, and I was thinking about how much trouble we got in that basement over the years. And, 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 and we were cleaning out this basement down there. And I was thinking, you know, really, it was Seth. I think it was Seth that got us in a lot of the trouble, <laughs> honestly. I think it was. I mean, at different times, we all kind of, Andrew caused some trouble too, but... I think a lot of it was oftentimes Seth that was getting into trouble. But as I look around, there's not, there's not a section, there's not a person or not a section of this place that doesn't have at least one person that I grew up with going to church here with and going to youth group with. And how those connections, for me, at this point in my life, those connections, they just become more important the older I get. And having people that I look to and say, you know what? We've been through different things in our lives. We've had some trials, some ups and some downs. But it kind of reminds me of Abraham returning to that place before the Lord. It's just nice to know that there's a place that we can return to that's home. It's nice to know that there's a place that we can return to the church. And, and, and I want this instilled in my kids that no matter what happens, a lot of us when we hit 18, we take some detours. We go different places and we go different ways. But it's nice to know that when you come back to the church, you're always home. You're always home and you always belong here. And, and, and so why don't we send our kids to youth? I, I, I think in the history of our church, one of the most frustrating things for me is, is this idea that we have always had a lot of kids in our church. We had a church come to us, another church in the community, a, a, a larger church in the community come to us a couple of years ago and say, how do you get so many people to come to Vacation Bible School? They, they, they couldn't understand why we had so many kids. And I said, well, it's basically, Vacation Bible School, you have to understand, is basically free babysitting. That's what it is. <laughs> and so you, yes, to the parents, yeah. It's basically free babysitting. That's what it is, free childcare. And that's fine. But we, 
We'll have 100 kids at Vacation Bible School. We'll have 30 or 40 kids at Sunshine Kids on a Sunday morning. Crazy. Sixth grade and below, 40 kids. And we've always done this, and I've done this in the last few years. I look at that group and I go, man, look at that group. And when you look at that group and think, in a few years, they're going to start moving up and they're going to be in the youth group. And we're going to have this youth group that's going to be huge. But, in a, and this isn't just now, this is throughout the course of this church, inevitably that, that number, as you get older, that number gets smaller and the commitment level to the church, it weakens, it lessens. And that, that, that group that you thought was going to be this huge group ends up with a very small number of people. And I, I, don't know, I don't know what the reason behind that is. I think there are probably different answers to that. But that's why I'm asking you. And I'm asking you to consider that. Let, let's leave that there and let's go to the next question. Why don't we gather in small groups? I didn't know that the community group this morning was going to do that little announcement. And they probably didn't know that I was going to touch on this topic this morning. But I'm going to. And, and really both of these, and, and I could have picked a lot of different things to talk about this morning, but both of these are, are things that have been on my heart since I took over this ministry. I think, I think our youth program is, is, is vitally important to the health of the church. And I think the idea that we would gather together, we, we're, we call them community groups, like small groups, life groups, whatever you want to call them. I've been hitting on this from day one. And, and I'm going to hit you with it again today, and I just want to mention a couple things. Why don't we gather together throughout the week in smaller groups? Part of the answer for, for you in this church is very easy. You can look at us and say, well, we just haven't had small groups to join. You're, you're, you're right. You're right. We haven't. Now, I would look right back at you and say it's almost impossible to start small groups if there's not a commitment level from people to start those groups. So it's a two-way street. But we, because we feel this is important, we hired someone who, who with the, he has the sole purpose of starting community groups. And I'm very thankful for what Gene's doing and the foundation that's being laid and just with one group. And when it came down to it, and I, and I remember talking to the board when we hired Gene, do not judge this position in six months don't judge this position in a year because we're going to start slow. We're going to lay a foundation and it's going to take time. And that's, what, that's what's happened up here. And, and I can tell you when I looked up at this group here today that was standing up here and they laughed about their connections with one another and, and I'm looking and I'm saying, I can already see what God is doing in our church through that group. I can already see it. And it's only been a few months. And they're starting a foundation, it's slow, and it's, and it's going to build, and it's, gonna, it's gonna, getting ready to multiply. Uh, but I just, I just kind of wonder, and I want you to consider, why wouldn't we be a part of that? Now, I'm going to hit on one particular area of small group life or community group life that I think is, is fairly important. And, and I'm going to tell you how it works in my life, and it works through, in my life through our Wednesday night prayer group. But the, the, the uh, ability to come together and pray for and pray with one another is such a, a, a foundational part of that community group life. And what that does when you pray for each other and pray with each other. When we come on Wednesday night, the idea on Wednesday night is that we pray, that we spend an hour in prayer. And usually we'll open that hour and I'll, I'll ask, are there any prayer requests? And, and we'll just kind of shout things out, things that we know about, people that are sick, people that are in the hospital, just different prayer requests. Now, I didn't really intend for this to happen, but what has happened along the way is I'll just say, like, can you all pray for me? Sometimes I'll ask for it. Sometimes they just, they just pray for me anyways. But a lot of it has become this group praying for me. Uh, because I need a lot of prayer. And so they're praying for me, and they're praying for me. And what, what happens is every week, right about Wednesday, right about the point where I'm at my lowest point thinking I'll never be ready for Sunday, and I'll, I'll never have another uh, revelation from God again. I don't know what to say. Right about Wednesday, when this group comes and prays for me, okay, Lord, thank you. 
And, and now I feel like I can get up there and, and do that thing again. See, there's something that happens here. And I, I want to go to, if, if you remember this story in Exodus, I love this. Exodus chapter 17, verses 11 through 13. I love this story. It, this is when God had told um, Moses to send some people out to, to, to war. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So Moses had sent Joshua out to war against Amalek, and Moses had gone up on the mountain. And what he realized is this, as long as he held his arms in the air, they, won, they were winning the war. But when his arms dropped... They would lose the battle. It says this in verse 12. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So Joshua was uh, victorious in the battle because... They stood there with Moses and they held his hands up when his hands got tired. Now, if I could describe for you for a moment what happens on Sunday morning, and, and uh, today's a good day. I'm, I'm a little under the weather this morning, and so this is probably a good day to actually talk about this. But, but what you see in the natural is, is far different from what's happening in the spiritual. And, and, and I think there's these two realms going on, the, the natural, the physical world that we can see, and then there's a spiritual realm that maybe we don't see the same way. But in the natural, I come up here and, 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 I, and I really feel like, okay, I'm prepared, I'm ready for this. I'm going to get up there. I, I try to come up here with confidence. I, I, like to, uh, I, I like to laugh so we can make some jokes and enjoy this time. Uh, so I, I come up here and I, and I feel like I'm confident. I speak confidently. I walk around. I'm waving my arms. I, I'm kind of doing my thing. And, 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 and so I don't know if you see me as a confident person, but I, I feel like I'm a confident person. And, and I come up here and I take responsibility for what I say to you. I've messed up. I've made mistakes. That's on me. I try to own that. But I come up here, I try to come up here and speak with confidence. That's in the natural realm. What I can tell you is this. In the spiritual realm, I feel like I have the weight of the world on my shoulders. I feel like every word is potentially the word that could change someone's eternal destiny. And that seems dramatic, but that's just how I feel. So whatever you see in the natural, walking around and me waving my hands and, and the confidence that I might exude in the spiritual, I feel like I have the weight of the world on my shoulders. But what happens for me is this, and this is why I wanted to read that story with you. I don't think I could take another step or speak another word, but there are people that are literally holding my hands up. So what you see me is walking around with confidence in the spiritual realm. I'm walking around like this. And it would be weird if I walked around like this all day. <laughs> but in the spiritual realm, I'm walking around like this. Even though I can't hold my hands up on my own, there are others who are holding my hands up for me. Because what they, and it's not for my glory. It's for God's glory. And so they're holding my hands up for me. So what Wednesday night has become, uh, this group of people that get together to pray, and we pray for a lot of things, but selfishly, I'm like, can we get to the part where you guys pray for me? Now, that's just a part of what happens in community groups. The, the ability to pray for one another, the responsibility and, and being able to say, because now I'll just come in and I'll just, I'll just tell them, like, I'm struggling. I don't know up from down. I, I, I'm, I'm in a fog, I think is what I said Wednesday. I'm, I'm in a fog. I don't, I don't know where I'm going, what I'm doing. And they just pray for me. And, and all of a sudden, my hands just get lifted up in that battle. And it's not so I can win a battle. It's so God can be glorified. So God can be glorified. Now, as I tell you that story, there's, there's probably a couple of reactions that you might be having. Uh, the first one is, wow, 
Kevin's really screwed up. We, we really should be praying for him. And I'm not going to turn the prayers down. That, that's, I'm not going to turn the prayers down because I know how valuable those prayers are. So if you hear any of that and think, we should be praying for him, please pray for me. The second reaction might be this. Hey, Kevin, get over yourself. We all have burdens. And I'll be honest with you, that's the exact reaction I'm going for. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I feel like I have the weight of the world on my shoulders. But I know this, so do many of you. So do many of you. You have the weight of the world on your shoulders. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. You're carrying great burdens in this world. And so my question to you this morning is this. Why would you rob yourself of the opportunity to have a group of people around you who will hold your hands up when those burdens get so heavy? And that's what community groups do. Community groups do that in a way that this thing here on Sunday morning can't do that. Can't do it. But those community groups can do that. And why would you, who I know my burdens are different from your burdens and your burdens are different from my burdens, but they're just as real, they're just as heavy, they're just as important. Why would you take away from yourself the opportunity to have people that will come alongside you and carry those burdens with you? I want to challenge you on a couple things as you're thinking about community groups. And, and, and to be honest with you, why wouldn't you go to a barbecue? It's, it's, so, it's a barbecue. I don't think it's like they're going to sell timeshares or anything. It's like, like, I think it's going to be pretty laid back. But if you're thinking about community groups, let me lay out a couple of challenges for you. <laughs> Some people might say, well, I have... I have plenty of Christian friends and fellowship in my life. In fact, we spend a lot of time together while we're doing fill-in-the-blank, whatever fill-in-the-blank is. Like, we all... I'm trying to think of something that's not obvious, but... I, I can't, so never mind. Uh, we all spend a lot of time together while we're doing X. If the primary reason for you being together is not the community group, that's a wonderful thing. Thank God that you have Christian friends and family that you associate with in your life and that are part of your life in these other areas, but it's not the same thing. So if you're saying, hey, we, we spend a lot of time together, it, we all kind of have this common thing in our life and we spend a lot of time together, that's great. But that's not the same thing as setting a time aside in the week to say, we're going to get together for the specific building up edification of the body of Christ. That's our primary purpose. When you do that, that thing right there requires sacrifice. And when it requires sacrifice, it becomes something in, that has far more value than to say, we're already doing this thing. And while we're doing it, there's some Christian fellowship. That's great. I'm not telling you that that's not good. I'm telling you it's not the same thing as having a time in your week where you say we're going to set aside this specific time, whether we are busy or not, we're going to have this time where we come together with the body of Christ in a smaller group and we're going to build each other up, we're going to support each other, we're going to talk about scripture, we're going to do whatever it is that we do. That's a different thing. The other thing I would, I would tell you, and, and, and Kristen touched on it this morning, some, some of you might say, oh, you know what, we're interested in a community group, here's the list of people we want in our group. <laughs> that, see, like Kristen said, I'm going to pick on Kristen because <laughs> she wouldn't have picked the people that stood up here this morning with her, but if she wouldn't have picked them, she would have lost out. I'm going to tell you this, the people here on Wednesday night that have become so important to me and to my ministry, it's not necessarily the group of people that I would have picked. But I'm telling you this, they pray for me in such a way that ah, those are the people I want praying for me. And I, and I have almost nothing else in common with that group. Almost nothing else in common. 
So those first two questions, and I, and I get that that was kind of a detour, it's really to ask this third question. Why don't we trust God that there's another way? And when I look at chapter 19 of, of, of Genesis that I've struggled with, I've told you I've struggled with it, uh, we, we could talk about anything today. We could talk about our kids, the way we raise our kids, the way we run our families. We could talk about managing our time. We could talk about jobs. We could talk about marriages. We could talk about single life. We could talk about sexuality. We could talk about money. We could talk about almost anything. I chose two things that have been on my heart that I think are relevant to this church. But we could talk about almost anything. And my question is this, when do we get to a point where we say, no matter what's going on, no matter what the trial, no matter what the situation, I'm going to trust God that there's an alternative way to handle things. There's an alternative way to, to run my life. There's an alternative way for me to raise my kids that maybe the world's not saying, but I know that there's a better way to do it. If we, look at the, if we look at the contrast and the comparison between Lot's daughters and Ruth, I think it shows us a per perfect example. Lot had two daughters, and after this destruction had come, after Sodom and Gomorrah had, had been destroyed, they went off and they ended up in a cave. And it says this in verse 19, or excuse me, chapter 19, verse 31. It says, Now the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is no man on the earth to come into us, as is the custom of all the earth. There's nothing for us to do now. Now, I take issue with that, and there's some, there are some scholars who believe that they, in this cave, thought that they were the last people on earth. That much like the judgment of the, of the flood, that they thought, after this judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, that they, they had to repopulate the earth. Now, I, I have an issue with that, because in the brief time after God sent the fire to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, they dwelt in another city. And there were other people in that city. And they left that city for fear of those people. So they knew there were other people on the earth. They knew there were other people on the earth. And yet they had convinced themselves in this cave that we have no way out. We have no way out. And so they, they figured, okay, the only thing we can do here is, is lie with our father. I guess the other thing that hits me is this. They were convinced that the world was about to end, but somehow they had enough time to either produce or buy enough wine to get their father drunk twice. <laughs> See, oftentimes we get ourselves into these situations and, and we, we convince ourselves there's no other way but the way the world's telling us to do this. There's no other way to do this. And we, but we've, we've lied to ourselves to get to that position. We've convinced ourselves and we've conveniently ignored that there are other ways, that God has made other ways for us to get out of these situations or to handle these situations. But that's exactly what these two daughters had done. They, they, they got into this cave, the situation was desperate, and they thought, this is the only thing we can do. If you look, in comparison, if you look at Ruth, Ruth was in just as bad of a situation in her life. Her husband had died, and she had nothing. The only person she had in her life was her mother-in-law, who, whose husband had also died. So you had two women that were on their own, with no resources, no money, nothing. That's not a good place to be. And Ruth says, no matter what, I'm going to stay with you. Now, at that point, that, that decision is totally counterintuitive to what everyone else was telling her to do. Even Naomi was saying, go back to your people. There's nothing I can give for you. There's nothing I can do for you. There's no, there's no way for me. I'm not going to have another son. There's nothing you can do or nothing I can do to help you in this life. Go back to your own people. But Ruth says in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. 
I, I, I love that. But what's, what's powerful about that is when you think about Ruth came from Moab. And think about the, 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 the gruesome picture that I described for you earlier of that, of that pagan worship and the sacrifice of children and all of the other things that were associated with her culture and everything that she had grown up in. And she came and she met this woman, Naomi, and she realized that this woman has something that I want. And so what Ruth did in that moment is the, the world said the best thing for you to do would be to return to your people. But Ruth knew this. Even if it means that we're homeless with nothing left, I would rather be with Naomi because she knows the one true God. So when you look at Lot's daughters, what do they figure? We're, we're backed into a corner. Let's do this horrible, disgusting thing because we have no other choice. Ruth had no other choice, but she said, no matter what, I'm going to follow God. As, as Christians, I, I would just wonder, are we going to get to a point where we say, you know what? We're not going to raise our families the way the world's telling us to raise our families. We're not going to manage our time the way the world's telling us we need to manage our time. We're not going to manage our money the way the world's telling us we should manage our money. We're not going to run our lives the way the world's telling us we got, we're going to run our lives. There's a better way. And trusting God, are we going to get to that point where we say, Lord, I trust you that there's a better way. And even if I feel like, because I, I feel like as a Christian that more and more I feel like I'm being backed into a corner. And I'm being told, you have to forsake everything you believe and do this our way. That's what I feel like as a Christian. Maybe it's just me. But I feel like I'm being backed into a corner. And the more I'm backed into a corner, I can, I can do one of two things. I can go along with what the world says, or I can say, you know what, I, th I think there's another way. And I'm going to trust God that there's another way. As your pastor, I, I, I wanted to count up and I, I couldn't really get a good sense of how many generations there were between Moab and Ruth. I, I didn't really get that answer. But I guess what I want to say is this. I want to start seeing the Ruth story and not the Lot story. I want to see the Ruth story. Now, here's the, here's the good news. No matter what's in your background, no matter where you've come from, no matter what you've come out of, you can know this, that God can redeem you, restore you, and not only just redeem you and restore you, but he can put you smack dab in the middle of his plan to restore humanity. And that's what he did with Ruth. Ruth ends up in the lineage of Jesus, Matthew chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz beget, begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. So, Ra so Ruth has a son named Obed, who has a son named Jesse, who has a son named David, King David. And then goes on, eventually, to Jesus the Messiah. So Ruth was in the lineage of Jesus, this Moabite woman... And she was part of that plan, part of God's plan to restore humanity because at some point in her life she said, I think there's a better way. Even if it might require my sacrifice, even if it's going to be difficult, there's a better way. That's the story that I want to see. That's the story that I want to see for our lives, for my life, for, for this church, for this community. I want to see the story that says, you know what, we're going to do things a different way. We're going to make choices a better way. Let's stand today as we close, church. Carrie, if you have something, we'll just close quickly. But I thank God that he has continued to work through this pulpit. I thank God that he led us to the book of Ruth at the end of last year so that we could talk about this today. And we could have an example of relying upon God when there seemed to be no other option. I just, I want to start seeing that story in us. And I don't want to wait how many ever generations it took. <laughs> I want to see it now. I want to see it now. I want to see it here for us now. 
And I believe in my heart, we've made the call over and over again. I, I believe in my heart that there, almost everyone, if not everyone in this place, loves Jesus, believes in Jesus. I want to start to see us live that way. And to, and to say, that, you know what, no matter what, I'm going to live a different way. Even if the world would suggest that there's a one way to do things or a right way to do things, we're going to believe that there's a different way. I'll just close with this final thought. When we, when we find ourselves in a situation and we have a choice, maybe we don't feel like we have a choice, but we decide, you know what, no matter, no matter what, I'm going to look for God's way. And I'm going to wait upon the Lord. When we do that, we glorify God. So when we take the way out that the world's telling us to take, we rob God of his glory. But when we wait upon the Lord, when we say, you know what, there's a better way. Lord, there's a better way. I'm going to wait on you. I don't see it now, but I'm going to wait on you. And I'm going to find your way through this situation. When we do that, we glorify God. I want you to know, church, I, God's moving in this place. He is working. And sometimes I, I get so heavy. I told you I feel like I have the weight of the world on my shoulders. Sometimes I'm so heavy. I don't want to... I don't want to miss that. God is doing something in this place. And he's doing something in people in this place. And I want to continue to encourage you. I want to challenge you, but I want to encourage you. I believe God's moving here. And so I want you to be encouraged. And I want you to go through this week, whatever you face this week, if you find yourself in a situation where everything's telling you this is the way to go, I want you to ask, is, is this God's will for my life? And will this bring God glory? Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to come together. And, and, and just the response here, Lord, as you've begun to draw people together in this church. And, and what a wonderful privilege it is to just pray with one another. And, and to help carry those burdens with one another. Lord, I thank you for the people in this church that have made it part of their ministry to just, to just pray for me. What a privilege and a blessing that is. And I know I couldn't get up here if it weren't for those prayers. And yet I, I know, Lord, that every person in this place is carrying some burden, something in their life, some challenge they have, whatever it might be, Lord. And I know they need that same thing. They need someone praying with them, praying for them. Lord, I pray that you would get, continue to just draw us closer to you and draw us closer to one another that we could walk with each other through this life. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in this place. I never want to miss that. Sometimes I miss that. Forgive me, Lord. I know you're doing wonderful things in this place. And I pray that we would be a people that would continue to look for your will and continue to look for ways to glorify you in our lives. I pray, Lord, that as we go from this place today, that you would bless each person, that you would bless them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Church, be blessed. Have a wonderful day. Amen.